So this morning, we are starting, yes, a 13-week series of Corinthians. Say 13. Okay, I don't know why I asked you to say that, but it's a lot. So 13 sessions of Corinthians, but we feel uh, we start off uh, our theme um, for, for this 13-week series is called Messy Church. Because I don't know if you know, sometimes church is messy. If we allow messy people in, and I'm allowed, so it, it's messy. And so for us to, to see what God had done, has done through the church of Corinthians and in that ministry, I believe God is going to set us up, and, and you'll see there's some, there's some messiness. You saw it in the front, and it's represented here. But as we move along, I want you also to see how God is cleaning up our church from the inside out. There is a progression that you will see coming uh, that, we were, will, um, that we will see running through this word in Scripture. But for this morning's theme of church unity, um, I want you to give a round of applause and welcome uh, Roger Pierce uh, to our congregation, but also to give the word of God. Let's welcome him. Thank, Thank you. you friend. Thank you, friend. So the first time I saw Roger um, was in my internship 10 years ago. Can you believe? Really? End of the year, it's a decade. And so the first time I saw Roger and just my, my um, testimony about him, um, and he's got a lovely wife and family, and you can see how God has, has, has run through everything that he does and says uh, is also true in his family. I'm not saying he's, not, he's, he's perfect. I'm saying he's, he's getting lot. there. Um, but what I am saying is the first time I met Roger, he um, dealt with me in the same way that he dealt with, a, with an international speaker of that day. My heart was so blessed. I knew I was in the right spiritual family. I knew I was in the right leadership group as well. But just thank you so much just for always being you. Thank you for being Roger on stage and off stage, being loving here and there. And my testimony and my wife's testimony about you guys are just always amazing and loving. But here's the thing. I, I also want to say that, that we will not be here um, in this place if it wasn't for leadership. And we want to honor him as a leader and as our leader uh, in South Africa, let's, let's stretch out our hands and let's bless him before he gives us the word. Thank you, Father God, that I can place my hand on your chosen one. I pray, Father God, that you've not only prepared him, that his life's um, testimony is, is going to uh, um, testify through your word that it is true. But, Father God, I pray this morning that you um, will ex let us experience your love through the truth that Roger sh shares Thank you that he's here today, taking the time off, but also, Father God, just doing what you've called him to do. Thank you that he's in his lane, running as fast as he can, and, and also helping us to run in our lanes. Uh, we honor him, we love him, and treasure him in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Thank you, Marinus. I hope you recorded that introduction. I want to give it to my mother-in-law. <laughs> all I am, and all, all of us are, is sons and daughters of the Most High. And that's where it all starts, and that's where it all ends. And I'm a servant, and I'm here to serve you today. So please receive me that way. At the same time, love you, appreciate you, and celebrate who you are and what God is doing here. Um, let me quickly introduce my family to you. My wife, Nicola, I wish she's with you. She wishes she's with you, but she had commitments in Rosebank. We've been married this year for 32 years. Um, I feel like one of my greatest accomplishments was persuading her to marry me, and uh, she's an incredible pastor. She softens me. She helps me. She makes me a much better man. Um, she ministers a lot to the poor. She ministers in intercession and deliverance and healing, and I'm so grateful for her in my life. And then my sons, uh, I've got two sons and two daughters in love. We call them daughters in love, not daughters in law. So the one on the left, two on the left, that's James and Amy, and we sent both of our boys to Stellenbosch. They went to a very multicultural school in Johannesburg, Parktown Boys. Um, and the church is very multicultural. But the thing that they hadn't been exposed to was all the joys and the blessings of Afrikaans culture. I mean that. So we sent them to Stellenbosch. And um, man, you must see how they can soki. They are amazing. <laughs> They're so good that eventually the Platlands of Macy started to ask them to to learn some of their moves. So they've been part of the church plant into City Bowl, James and Amy. And that church, full of young people, about 250 young people, 
More than half of them have only got saved in the last two years, and it's really a testimony to God. James is full-time working as a consultant with EY, and Amy's a doctor. And on the right-hand side, the younger couple, Sean and Laura, Sean's campus ministry on Stellenbosch campus, and we have seen just such an increase of men evangelizing and going to evangelize. And uh, he's just doing an outstanding work there. As a parent, you worry about him and his finances because he's on MP. If you're supporting people on MP, give them more. You know, <laughs> we are big MP supporters of people, and Sean in particular. And Laura is um, next to Sean. She's an incredible teacher in Somerset West. So um, our kids are launched. For those of you whose kids aren't launched, I pray grace and strength <laughs> and patience. And uh, there were times when I was like, Ooh, there's so much arrogance here in the one, you know. Lord, help me not to say something or do something that I shouldn't do. Um, but they all love God and are serving God. So, fast bait and keep going if you've got young kids. Amen. Today, as we talk about the messy church, 1 Corinthians, know this God's word is timeless, God's word is relevant. God's word is real and it speaks to us today. It instructs us and it brings us hope and direction and clarity in the mess of Centurion, in the mess of Tuan, in the mess of Gauteng. It teaches us how to relate to one another in this crazy world. All scripture is powerful. All scripture is God-breathed. But this book in particular, I believe, speaks to South Africa at this time. So let's read 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 3. I'm not asking you to read aloud. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere, that's us, who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins addressing all of those who come together, all of us who have been set apart from the world. And he says, live differently. You've been made different. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart. You've been added to God's kingdom. You've been added to God's family. And this letter is calling everybody in Corinth, but it's also speaking to us, to live our lives in a different way. When it comes to unity, this is one of the things that I have labored for long and hard. There's always reasons for division. There's always reasons for separation. There's always reasons for offense. And one of the things I've worked hard on within local church, and Southern Africa, because it's the heart of God, is unity. You know, the devil, what he loves to see is a divided church. But the heart of God is to have everyone received and for us as God's house to be in unity, one with another. And he's saying, as Paul writes, he's saying you've been set apart and so you no longer live according to what, what you just learned in your family. Bring what was good from your family into the house of God. But you don't just live according to that. You don't just live according to your culture or your city. But we live according to God's heart and God's way and God's word. Now back around to Corinth. Um, let me tell you about the geography of Corinth and the situation. Corinth was the original sin city, okay? There were two big land masses and a little strip of land in the middle called an isthmus. So there was a sea on either side and land on either side. And so it was a perfect place for a seaport, big holiday port, but also a big city. And there was lots of traffic and people came for a short time. And so there was a lot of new people, there was a lot of anonymity, a lot of people were going incognito, there were lots of bars and brothels and shady places, 
where, did the, where, are the, where there are an anonymity and incognito, sin comes in. This is why as every nation we believe in spiritual family. <laughs> This is why we believe in iron sharpening iron. This is why we believe in relationships, not just on a Sunday, but through the week that we, that we build together. If you're living in isolation, you're in the danger zone because isolation kills us. We are called to live with one another. It's been said, I don't know who said it first. I'll try to find it. Show me your friends. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So what was specific about Corinth? They worshipped the goddess of sex and lust, Aphrodite, Romans call her Venus. She was originally from Astarte. She was uh, Astarte in, in Phoenicia. She was the, the queen of heaven, in inverted commas, the wife of Baal. And there was this massive temple in Corinth. There was over a thousand temple prostitutes and she, the, this, this goddess, was the patron of prostitution. And what you are supposed to do as a man is once a year, in order to have blessings upon you, you would go to the temple prostitute. This place was so bad that the name of the place became a verb, all right? So if you were like being seriously dodgy, you were Corinthianizing. <laughs> okay, then you know that it's a moral cesspit. Then you know there's trouble. Paul plants the church. Normally he would stay for a few weeks, but he actually stays here for a year and a half. And he really does his best to establish it. And he sends in Apollos afterwards, kind of like a modern day yaku, you know, skilled and graced and an apologist. So you'd think by this stage, this firm would be deeply established, but it was a wild, crazy environment. So there starts to come a lot of problems. There's massive infighting, disagreements. Some were saying they were more spiritual than others. Some were saying, I'm following Paul. Others saying, I'm following Apollos. Paul had to tell them it's not okay to sleep with prostitutes. It's not okay to sleep with your stepmother. I mean, literally, read, read, read Corinthians. Uh, one had his father's wife as a living mistress. Some were saying, don't judge, you know, don't judge, even don't judge sin. People were getting drunk during communion. So you thought you had a messy church? You have nothing on the Corinthian church. They segregated communion according to who was rich and who wasn't rich. They were suing each other. So the church was a messy church. But what is beautiful what is absolutely stunning is the way Paul addresses the church in this mess. And we read 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9. He says this, in the midst of hectic mess, he says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace, because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ amongst you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you'll be blameless on the day of Christ Jesus. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. He doesn't start with a clap across the head. He starts and he speaks about God's grace, God's kindness, God's goodness, and that God is going to see them through to the end. It all starts with God, with his love, with his forgiveness, and it all ends there. And, and if we understand God's grace, humility and love should flow from our hearts. I want you to imagine a Lord of the Rings scene. Okay, I'm not saying you must watch Lord of the Rings, okay, but imagine a Imagine a dark castle, all right? This is like Mordor and um, Sauron is running this castle and, and you thrown into the prison in the darkest dungeon. Just imagine that for a moment. And you surrounded by terrible criminals who are persecuting you and picking on you and they put you in a cage in the center of that dungeon and everybody's poking and prodding you. Your body's covered in sores 
your bones are broken, they're incessant, you can't sleep, you're starving, and you long to die. You just wish you would die. And the trouble is you deserve to be there. And all of a sudden, there's a smash and a crash and the doors are flung open and light shines in and it's like the SWAT rescue team that has come for you. And in they come and they fend off the prison guards and, and the prince leading it comes to your cage and undoes the lock and reaches for you. And you and your brokenness, like you shy away from him, but he gently pulls you to himself. He then passes you to one of his lieutenants who takes you and he goes into that cage and they lock the cage. And all of a sudden, the sores that were on your body disappear and they come on him. And your broken bones come right and, and his bones break. And you're taken away to this beautiful castle and you are looked after and you washed and you cleansed and you fed and you sleep and it's all beautiful. But you long to see that one who saved you. The days go by, and then he arrives. His bones are no longer broken, but he still carries the scars. My question to you is, how do you respond to that prince who has saved you? How do you respond to the one who's rescued you from that dark prison? The Bible says, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. The truth is we've all been forgiven much. And if not, just go back to your diary and remind yourself of some of the bad things that you did in case you feel like you're so righteous. I don't mean to insult you. But he has been forgiven much, loves much. And as we recognize what he has done, his grace, his mercy, love should come and gratitude. And that's what Paul's writing to them. And he's saying, you've received this. You've received grace and mercy, and you've been taken out of darkness. So therefore, you should be living a different life. And therefore, it is so strange that there's division. It's so strange that you're not unified together in your worship of God and building his church. So let's read our key scripture, and this is really what the sermon is about. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 13. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there are no divisions amongst you and that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels amongst you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apostle. Apollos, sorry, Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. And then the really spiritual say, I follow Christ. The divisions in the Corinthian church were huge. Three times in his letter, he writes about it. And the truth is they were divided over stupid things. You know, during COVID, we had some people, and I'm sure there are people here, who were very pro-vaxxing, and we had some people that were very Vax-free or anti-vaxxing. Okay, don't lift up your hand, okay? Uh, <laughs> and God bless you if you're pro-vax, and God bless you if you're vax-free or anti-vaxxing. But we made the statement to our churches, we're not going to separate over vaccinations. Can I get a yes or amen? I mean, we're not going to separate of, of those things. We're not going to separate some are Calvinists, some are Arminians. We're not going to separate because some people wear shoes, some people don't. <laughs> Amen. We're not going to separate about stupid things, right? There are some things that I'll die for, some things, not many, that I'll divide for, but there are many things that people decide over, and they are free to do that. And we live in unity on a greater mission to love and to glorify Him, to honor Him, to make disciples, to plant churches, to raise leaders, and we're not going to get stuck on small things. The enemy wants to divide us, wants to divide marriages, wants to divide families, wants to divide churches. And Paul's writing, he's saying, don't do it. Don't get divided. It's okay to have differences of a certain nature, 
What's not okay is to build fences and walls and put gun turrets on there. You know, there's part of our brain, almost like a mental process that, that kicks in. Um, when you identify somebody as hostile, as enemy, faint, I'm sure you've experienced that. You know, where all of a sudden you've recategorized somebody in your head. Enemy. <laughs> okay, who's ever done that? Who's got a whole processing, you know, for, you know, people who drive? I, I don't know what your processing is. And we live in this, in this cancel culture. I bumped into a leader who used to be part of one of our churches. And um, when they left, we appealed to them, please don't do this. And now they're separating and probably getting divorced. But I bumped into the wife early one morning, about a year ago. And she said to me, yeah, I was so offended by what somebody had put on social media that I'm going to defriend them. Yeah, I'm going to defriend them. Okay, so I went away and I thought, thought this. If they have brother, sister in Christ, then what business have we got defriending them? Engage them, but don't defriend them. On the other hand, if they're not Christians, then we should be reaching out to them, right? So I just came away saying, on what basis do we cancel people? On what basis do we reject people? On what basis do we allow division to come in? And we need to be really careful about making people in our heads, our enemies, categorizing them in our hearts and our heads. Okay, so what, what unity is not? It's not uniformity. It's not that we have to make everybody look the same and sound the same and speak the same. There's a creativity. The Bible talks about the manifold wisdom of God is revealed through the church. The polypoikolos. It's like this beautiful light, rainbow. You know, I know rainbow's got bad connotations now. But imagine glorious light. You bring your gift. You bring who you are. You bring what God has called you to be, and we become richer, and we become stronger. So it's not uniformity. At the same time, it's not avoiding issues. If things need to be fixed, let's fix them. If things need to be spoken of, let's speak of them. If things need to be addressed at a micro or a macro level, in your family, in your marriage, in church, in the nation, we do it. And it's not overlooking sin. Unity doesn't mean we overlook sin. Discussion, engagement, is meant to shed light, whereas fighting just brings heat. Discussion is a searching for truth and to understand one another's hearts. But fighting is about superiority and it's about winning. Unity is giving Christians the same grace that God gave us. It honors differences, it honors giftings, and unity differentiates between what is critical and what isn't. Okay, so why is unity so important? Firstly, Jesus prayed for it, okay? His great high, peace, high priestly prayer, praying for his disciples, but praying for all of us. He prayed for all future Christians, he prays this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. I don't know if you've ever been in a city where there's a church on every corner, a different denomination, and more and more being found. I went to Nigeria, Lagos, and it was just grievous. And every church, it's apostle, prophet, super apostle, bishop, whatever, you know. <laughs> and there's no unity. Jesus prays that they might be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, just as you, as you learned recently of the Trinity. May they also be in us so that the world may believe. Okay, it's a gospel issue that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. 
Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prayed for it. Jesus commanded it. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What are some unity destroyers? Firstly, me. <laughs> okay? Ego. When me is greater than we, when your rights, your passions, your preferences, your opinion is more important than the whole. Satan's original sin was pride. That he wanted to raise himself up. And when the me is greater than the we, it's a unity destroyer. Secondly, sin and selfishness destroys unity. When we sin against one another, and when we're selfish with what we have got, our times, our gifts, our talents, it destroys. If there has been sin, it can be fixed. If there has been selfishness, it can be fixed with repentance. But where there's unrepentance and no apologies, then it's a unity destroyer. When there's unrighteous judgment, you can judge, the Bible says, and you'll, read about, you'll hear about this later on through the sermon series. There are times that we can judge, but unrighteous judgment and assumptions about people is a unity destroyer. And then unforgiveness destroys unity. How do we live unity? Three verses, 1 Corinthians 13, which we always use in marriages, but it's not specifically talking about marriage. <laughs> love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong, it always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. My wife, Nicola, damaged her spine, and um, for the last seven years, it's been a very difficult season. She's had operations, and she's on a lot of chronic meds, and she doesn't get a lot of relief. And in the first year of the pain that she's going through, it started to put some strain on our marriage. And a friend told me the story. He said, imagine you come into a room and the one that you love, your husband, your wife, whoever, is fighting this big black beast, okay? Physically fighting, wolf, bear, whatever. Fighting this big black beast and you climb in and you fight the beast with her. You punch the beast, you kick the beast, you bite the beast. But in this fight, the one that you love bites you and scratches you, and kicks you, whatever. And at the end, you fight the beast off, right? But you come out of this like a bit scratched and bruised and broken, not just from the beast, but from what your wife or your loved one has just done to you. If that's the case, do you take offense? Of course not. <laughs> yes, you've come off a bit scratched and bruised, but together you have faced down the enemy. And as this friend of mine told me that story, it just changed my perspective on what my wife was going through. And it changed my stance on how to love her through what she's going through. That it doesn't just apply to your spouse and it doesn't just apply to somebody in great physical pain. Everybody's fighting stuff. <laughs> Everybody's facing challenges. Everybody's got concerns. And can we start to extend grace and love and kindness expressed in believing the best, keeping no record of wrong, protecting, trusting, hoping, and persevering? The next two verses are ones that, if you're going to get a tattoo, get this tattoo, okay? If you want to live your Christian life well, if you want to 
live healthily in community. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, brother or sister, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him, alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. So I go to churches. I'm like a church consultant. That's kind of what I do, you know. My main thing isn't Sundays. My main thing is like back office, fixing things in the week. Um, we would, I would avoid like, I, 90% of my job would be done. I wouldn't even have it if people just lived this. If they just lived this within the church, that if you've got something that you hurt or concerned or didn't understand that or why did you do it or that hit me, you just go to your brother. You just go to your sister. You don't tell your five friends because you need counseling first. <laughs> you don't create a support group for your faction. <laughs> you go to your brother, to your sister, and give them an opportunity to say, I'm sorry, you're right, or I'm sorry, you're right, but also you did this to me, and then you get a chance to go. This week, Thursday, I met with a brother that um, is one of our apostolic leaders who I love, who I respect, who's amazing, but we're missing each other. We took the time and trouble to meet and to talk it through. I made sure that I went into that meeting without too much caffeine in my system. <laughs> went for a good long run beforehand. I wanted to be in a place to hear him properly. And the meeting went fantastically. I apologized. I said, I didn't see that, I didn't see that. He apologized. And I'm not keeping score who apologized more. But we applied this verse. You want to live in unity as a church, and I know you do. Then take hold of this. When you've been hurt, wounded, sinned against, the word of God requires us to go to that person and resolve it. Matthew 5 is saying, you're in the holy of holies, you're in the presence of God, you're worshiping, God's on the move, you're offering your gift at the altar, and then you remember that your brother has something against you. All of a sudden, somebody's name pops up, you know, their face pops up. In your holy moments of enjoying God, and God says to you, hold on a second, buddy. This guy's got something against you. What does it say? Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. The cross is vertical and it's horizontal. And we don't have the luxury of saying, you know, me and God, we good, but I hate everybody else. You don't have that luxury. You can't say that. You can't say you, you love God and hate your brother. So God is saying, you know, your worship, your sacrifice, what you're doing, a better worship, better sacrifice would be to make right with your brother, to fix what's amiss, and then come and bring your sacrifice to God. Psalm 133, Song of Ascent, says this, how good and how pleasant it is when the brothers or the brothers and sisters live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon, remember Israel was, is dry, it's a very dry middle uh, Mediterranean climate. The dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Where does he do it? He does it with his unity. You want to attract the blessing of God? You want to attract his favor upon your life? Live in unity with your brothers, your sisters in Christ. The good news, the great news, is that God's grace empowers us to live in unity. God's grace enables you to forgive. Sometimes this is what I do. You know when you've got something in your heart that's just sticking? Okay, maybe none of you like it, maybe it's just me. Okay, you've got something like sticking in your heart? 
I just think of how much God has forgiven me. And then I go like, how can I not forgive them? When I think of God's grace, when I take hold of God's grace, I'm able to forgive. I'm able to engage. I'm able to confront. I'm able to go to them. Today, will you take hold of God's grace? (laughs) Will you take hold of God's grace where you need it to walk in unity with your brother, with your sister? When we pray the Our Father prayer, how do you pray it in Afrikaans? Where it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Say it aloud. Forgive Exactly. Can we bring our hearts before the Lord now and pray for God's grace upon us? Can we commit again to live in the unity that God expects us to? Paul spoke to this messy church in this crazy city of Corinth, and he said, stop being, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of this I'm of that. As we come together in unity with hearts of love, His presence, His power, and His blessing comes upon us. Can we pray together?